Chair. Hey Bill, how are you doing?
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the City of Independence, I welcome each of you in attendance, as well as those of you who may be watching on <clears throat> City 7, to the January 23rd, 2018 meeting of the Independence Planning Commission. Before we begin our meeting, let's stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our meetings, it is the responsibility of this commission to hold public hearings and make recommendations to the Independent City Council on matters relating to zoning and land use changes within our city. We also consider and make decisions on plats, special use permits, and other issues, as well as changes in codes and policies that relate to city planning. Our procedure tonight for each case is as follows. First, the applicant will be recognized to speak on behalf of their case, followed by anyone else in attendance that wishes to speak in favor of the matter. Second, those who are in opposition of the matter or who have questions regarding the case will be recognized to speak. Then, if there was opposition or questions from the public, the applicant will be allowed a rebuttal period to address those questions or concerns. Once the applicant is finished, the chair will declare the public hearing portion of the case closed and further comment from the public will not be recognized. Then at that point, the commissioners will have the opportunity to discuss the merits of the case with one another. And during that discussion, the commission reserves the right to ask questions of all parties concerned and then finally, the commission will render a decision in the case. Because this is the only public hearing of the cases on the agenda tonight, all those who wish to speak will be heard. All comments and questions should be addressed to the chair and not directly to the applicant or to the staff. The chair also requests that statements be kept brief and on point and that if a statement has already been made by another previous speaker, please do not repeat it, but simply indicate that you agree on that matter with them as well. Now to expedite tonight's meeting, the chair asks that everyone here who wishes to testify or thinks that they may testify, please stand now and be sworn in. Those who are standing, please raise your right hand do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth before this commission? And if you do, please answer, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, staff, is there any changes to the agenda tonight? No. Okay. Okay, the first uh, item on the agenda is case number 18-100-01, rezoning of 19901. East US 40 Highway. The staff give the report, please. Moaz Construction seeks to uh, rezone the property at 19901 East 40 Highway from RA, which is residential agriculture, to C3 Service Commercial to continue its, to continue its business operations. As uh, this slide shows the, is the vicinity map that shows the general location of the site, which is on the south side of 40 Highway. Subject property is in the Oval. Residential property in the city of Lee Summit adjoins this property to the south. This is the zoning map for this area of uh, East 40 Highway. The zoning for the area is either RA, like the applicant's property, C1, which is to the, uh, directly to the east west, or C2, which is uh, to the north and further to the west. The R18 zoning north of the site is actually a mobile home park. Now, this is a recent aerial photo of the site taken in early 19, 2016. Uh, you can see there's various uh, equipment and materials and vehicles visible on the site. 
a daycare school is to the west um, and then single family homes to the south in Lee Summit. This rezoning map, this rezoning map shows the uh, applicant's property and the surrounding property owners, properties where the public notices were sent out to. Okay, this is the uh, applicant has created a plan showing the improvements that will be made to the site after the rezoning is approved or if the provided the rezoning is approved, including a parking lot paving and overall site reorganization. Okay, here's some pictures of the area. Okay, we're standing on uh, the uh, <coughs> eastbound lanes of 40 Highway looking at the driveway into the applicant site. That's, uh, you can see there's fences along there and then a gate at the driveway. Okay, we're inside the site. We're looking to the, uh, looking to the east. We're kind of up on top of the hill, uh, looking down into the site. As you can see, it's a gravel area with various types of vehicles and equipment around. This is another picture that shows more of the site. Uh, as this was midday, much of the equipment is out at the job site. And this is the uh, house the single family house that was converted into an office for the business. Okay, here we're looking across from the applicant site to the uh, island, I guess you'd call that, in between the eastbound and the westbound lanes of 40 Highway. It's actually a private property, um, it's vacant. Uh, this is the crossover, I call it the crossover between the northbound, excuse me, the eastbound and the westbound lanes. I think it's a, actually a, a continuation of a Valley View Road. And the applicant eventually seeks to uh, change his parking, uh, excuse me, his driveway location down to this site, down to this vicinity, so he can directly access this crossover road. Makes vehicles easier to get in and out of the site. Okay, here we're on the uh, eastbound lane of uh, 40 Highway looking into the site. It's winter time, there's no, no leaves or on the trees, so it's more visible. And here we're looking uh, east down the eastbound lane of 40 Highway, and north or west up, up 40 Highway, also on the eastbound lane. And then staff does recommend approval of this application. Okay, thank you. Uh, would the applicant uh, please come forward? State your name and uh, address for the record, please. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the commission, I'm Jim Gamble. I'm an architect uh, and have uh, and live in this uh, community at uh, 3500 South Myers Ridge Court and represent Moaz tonight here with the owners. The owners are uh, Mr. Terry Hefta and, uh, and Bill Peck and they're here with us uh, uh, tonight and are available to answer any questions or correct anything that I have misspoke. Um, uh, a while back uh, Moaz received a Dear John letter from the city. Uh, more specifically is that you have the incorrect zoning and a cease and desist of their operation and to make that correction. Uh, they've been given time to uh, come before this body and the, uh, and the uh, city council t for uh, rezoning and, uh, and that's our purpose here tonight. Um, Moaz, something about them, uh, I have driven by this property a hundred times probably and never did really see it there. If you're moving uh, eastbound on uh, 40 Highway, it's a, the, the highway is divided at this location. There's some maybe 300 feet, I would say, 250, 300 feet between the east and west bound. Uh, part of it is private property, part of it still belongs to MoDOT that is not developable. Um, but as you go east, uh, you, you come out of the uh, retail portions there near uh, 470, 291, and uh, there is a considerable grade change, uh, a high hill, 
uh, past that, there's a, a, a Creative World uh, daycare uh, facility up on the hill and then afterward uh, and through a cut uh, is uh, approximately eight acres of this property that belongs to Moaz. They've been there some 13 years and have, uh, uh, and the, the purpose of their, their property is that they do underground utility uh, improvements. Uh, they install uh, all manner of uh, utilities uh, underground. And uh, every morning at early in the morning, there will be 30 people perhaps uh, appear. They'll park their private vehicles there. Uh, they'll get in a line of trucks and heavy equipment and off they go to uh, uh, points in eastern Jackson County predominantly and do underground utility uh, corrections or improvements or whatever for a number of different utilities. Uh, they've been doing that some 13 years at that uh, same location and uh, is a substantial uh, uh, business uh, of our community. Um, as you go east on on eastbound 40 highway or yes 40 highway here uh, it's uh, difficult to see there's a stand of trees next to the uh, roadway that somewhat blocks it the staff had a uh, had a letter or had a, a good view of that um, and then uh, around it uh, to the west is a is a high grade change and a hill that goes ev eventually and a stand of trees that Mr. Gable, the, the aerial is on the screen if you want to look at that when you discuss this. Yes. Okay, uh, to the west of the immediate property is this uh, uh, hill. I would say uh, offhand there's probably a 30 foot, 40 foot grade change up to Creative World and a young forest that is uh, between that property and where they uh, serve their uh, equipment and, and their operation. Uh, uh, to the east is a floodplain and belongs to mainly government uh, 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 ownerships. I think the county owns part of it in there and, and eventually works its way to the Little Blue uh, river eventually in the in the flood plain and the floodway there to the south is the south property line is a jurisdictional line between Independence and Lee Summit Missouri and uh, there is a, a considerable stand of trees there and then it climbs to a residential single-family residence residential subdivision that is in the city limits of Lee Summit Missouri and uh, a very nice subdivision, by the way. Uh, there are two people here tonight that I know of uh, in support of it, and I have a letter uh, here, and I'll give it to the staff. I'll read it uh, uh, just briefly. It says, uh, my name is Jamie Johnson with my family-owned property at 1212 Northeast Long Ridge, adjacent to the Moes Construction Company's business to the north of ours, their distance there's a distance grade change to substantial stand of trees that separates our property with Moaz Company property. We've been good neighbors together and do not object to their rezoning request. I'll give this to the staff. Uh, I'd like to read from the staff report uh, some of the comments made. It says the this segment of East US 40 Highway east of the Little Blue Parkway has experienced a slower level of development than the area around M291 and 40 Highway interchange. Floodplain areas, rough terrain, and lack of sanitary sewer contributes to this pattern. As such, development of properties here have leaned toward land uses, necessitate fewer public services and the lower level of site improvements like the applicant's proposed use. It goes on to say, if properly maintained by the applicant, the proposed C3 zoning should be less intrusive than most C2 uses, particularly like retail, restaurants, and banks. Um, we, we had a staff 
conference with the various departments represented and the owners and uh, reviewed the property and uh, if we have a favorable uh, outcome of the zoning then there is uh, still some work to be done on the property really a reorganizing somewhat of it uh, the staff touched upon it uh, there is a uh, drawing of it that they can project on it. I have some with if you would like to see it. That would include some uh, some um, a water detention area for runoff because they would pave part of it. They would organize it perhaps a little tighter than what it is now. There are currently um, um, uh, fencing uh, be between the highway and their property in, in addition to the stand of trees along 40 highway uh, there would be some improvements to that the city requested to have some handicap parking we've we were complying with uh, all of the requests that would then be turned in for a permit for uh, some improvements to the property to bring it up to uh, uh, the itinerary that came from that uh, that conference uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that I could from members of the Commission um, and the owners are here with me if I if I have any if said anything that uh, should be further elaborated please uh, uh, assist me in that regard and uh, mr. chairman at that point uh, up to you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> the the uh, commissioners have questions of Mr. Gamble or uh, Terry or Bill. You mentioned water retention basin. Go into that for me a bit. Explain well, how we're going to manage the water in a hard surface parking. There is a city ordinance regarding um, parking surfaces. The Moaz company has proposed to uh, pave with a hard surface uh, part of this property. Part of it is still going to be a fill area and also has heavy equipment on it. So part of it they do not intend to pave. Uh, when you pave, hard surfaces there is a MDNR requirements that the city uh, complies with and requires uh, uh, owners of property in the city to also comply and that is if you create uh, uh, water runoff then it's required then to have water detention to detain 100 year flood uh, volumes to then be metered into uh, uh, runoff after that and so we have uh, graphically illustrated on that uh, front uh, page there where uh, it fits very naturally in what the property is because the property uh, flows in that direction and then there would be a, a detention improvement there there's an alternative they can purchase by just writing a check and then subscribe to a larger detention areas elsewhere so that the net for the city does not increase so but this is uh, one uh, possibility and uh, perhaps probability of how that might uh, ultimately uh, uh, take place does that uh, detention basin have an outlet uh, all detention basins have to have an outlet and they're metered uh, an engineer will will make a determination as to metering the water out to flow uh, after a hundred year event or after any event and then uh, permit that to uh, uh, flow at a lesser rate uh, out of the detention pond yes so that's why it's not shown because pardon me is that why it's not shown on here that there's not an outlet well, I'm not, this doesn't have detailed 
Okay. This is a concept here, and uh, a civil engineer would be hired to make the calculations, to make the size, the, and to create the, the calculations for the orifice that uh, discharges water into the floodplain. Um, just a quick question, too. Um, I don't know, of course, how heavy your equipment is, but um, is the asphalt parking lot going to be able to take the well, weight of your equipment? There is a pesky ordinance that requires a hard surface. We're trying to comply to that. Sure. At the same time, it can be torn up. So uh, that asphalt or concrete, it could be concrete, uh, would have to be of, a, of such thickness that it would withstand the heavy equipment that this is constantly uh, uh, subject to. Okay. Uh, Billy, did you get your question yeah. answered? Okay. Uh, just a follow on. It appears, am I correct, you're shifting some portion of the operations to the east well, to align with South Valley View at least from an entrance point, is um, that correct? In the future, undetermined in the future, the idea would be to perhaps create a connection to Valley View Road mm -hmm. at the location showed on this drawing. Okay, the grade is not high enough to perfectly align that to that intersection. So. There's a note here that this would be a future fill area. Now, over 13 years, they have filled uh, parts of this property, but this would be an addition and would continue to fill with a permit and it'd be a controlled fill that uh, would then be built up, compacted, and then, uh, and then a structure of some kind has to uh, cross over to make that connection to Valley View uh, Road there. So it'd have to either be a substantial culvert or some kind of a bridge structure, which is a, uh, uh, an expense and a, and a creation of a, of a structure that would have to be uh, installed there. But this does allow for that to happen in the future. Yes, sir. The elevation from the daycare to the west that difference to the, the fall is about 30 feet uh, at least 30, uh, at least maybe more, maybe 50 feet and yes. the residence is to the south same that that ridge just kind of wrap around correct therefore even with the shifting there's no likelihood of a noise impact that's adverse to the residents to the south well uh, I'm not here to say there's no noise. Uh, there, is, uh, there are people here tonight that they can come up and tell you themselves of whether they're good neighbors or not. And we have invited them and we have a letter from them. But uh, I think generally they have been responsive to any, uh, any uh, complaints or any suggestions or whatever from people around them. Then we'll, just, we'll revisit that. Okay. Thank you. It, well, so the hours of operation are from generally when to when? Normally it's, uh, we start at 7 in the morning. And oh, sir, you need to come up to the microphone yes. and identify yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Terry Hefta. Uh, normally we start at 7 in the morning. The workers show up and then we try to be in back in the yard around 5.30 or 6 in the evening, just depending on the traffic, you know. Mostly Monday through Friday or some Saturdays occasionally? Uh, or? Just in an emergency, we'll work on the weekend. If there's an outage or something, uh, they have to get in to get the trucks. Sure. But uh, normally it's Monday through Friday. My question was, you know, the reason I asked that is because you're not operating a lot of loud equipment late at night anyway, apparently. So No, it, it's, it's okay. pretty rare, yeah. All right, great. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Uh, the process is in the morning on that drawing. You can see on the asphalt in tandem a lineup, 30 private vehicles. They get out of that, they get in these trucks and, and heavy equipment, off they go, come back in the evening, they come around, there's a dumpster here, they discharge debris in the dumpster that is hauled off site, and then they'll refuel at a refueling 
location there and we have that indicated on this too and then come around and reline up to go again the next day okay thank you any other questions of the gentleman here so so the 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 noise factor is mainly coming parking your car getting into equipment and then departing sure okay thank you all right gentlemen um, thank you um, is was there any um, is there anyone else here who would like to speak in favor of this uh, application yes sir just remember to state your name and address for the record please yeah uh, Jamie Johnson it's 1212 Northeast Long Ridge Road Lee Summit uh, one of the diagrams here I would be lot 16 backs up directly to the property in question uh, I have a business relationship with Terry and Bill we each provide a service for each other so at this point in time I would be definitely in favor of them being able to continue their work there uh, you know they have any times other neighbors uh, in my cul-de-sac area have had questions about some of their operations if I address it to Terry or Bill uh, they make the necessary corrections have always tried to be uh, good neighbors okay well thank you very much <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this case okay is there anyone uh, who either has questions or is uh, not in favor of this Please approach the podium. Make sure you speak into the microphone. Give us your name and address, please. Julie Hollowell, 1204 Northeast Long Ridge Road. I live just a couple doors down from Mr. Johnson, who spoke um, recently. He is a very good neighbor, and I trust that if he um, says that these folks are good neighbors directly behind him, that's a good sign. Um, I, we've never had really any complaints, except sometimes there's noise, but. Uh, we've become used to that. Um, my, I have a question though. I noticed in the analysis um, on the report it says that the only concern are the residential properties to the south and if tree coverage and sloping terrain remains intact then that shouldn't be a problem. Um, again this isn't going to be much of a change. I mean they're going to continue to do if the zoning has changed what they've been doing but I just wondered whether there's any assurances that the the tree coverage and the sloping would remain the same um, because the trees are quite uh, valuable when you, in terms of what you're looking at when you sit on your deck. In a, we do live in a fairly nice, I would say, you know, $300,000 to $750,000 homes back there. Um, and in the winter, we have a very good view of the operation from our deck, um, which isn't great, but any, it would be appreciated if there were assurances that the trees and everything would remain so that at least in the nice weather when we're in our yard or on our deck we don't have to look at it sure okay that's my only we'll get an answer to that um, question your view from your deck you're looking down into the site yeah I would say so through the trees through into the, the into the site yeah I'm, I was surprised to hear a 30-foot elevation. I know there is a 30, I mean, I don't know the elevation, but I do seem to think there's a significant elevation on the way up to the daycare. I didn't realize that there was such a, the same elevation on the way up to the neighborhood. I feel like we have a pretty good view in the winter, for sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, if you would look at the uh, screen on this, uh, you can see the uh, top of a, the roof of a house there off in the background. It kind of gives you an idea what the elevation change is, and it's pretty consistent across there. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Is there anyone else here who has questions or is opposed? All right. Um, staff, can you just answer her question? Um, I would believe that if, 
since it would be commercial now, if, if it's approved a commercial, that they have to maintain some kind of screening. That's right. I, I think that uh, uh, we would want to make sure, because there is a building permit involved in this, because of the amount of asphalt and so forth that's going to go with this, that we would want to make sure that there are certain undisturbed areas that, that it's, that's between the parking lot as shown on here and the uh, residents to the south. Uh, when I was out there, it seemed like some of that uh, landscaping area had been thinned out a little bit. Some trees removed. Perhaps uh, there could be some additional trees planted with it. in the future that would grow up and add to that. So also on their plan, it shows, a, it shows that the... Um, uh, forgive me, I'm looking at this. The gravel part where the main truck, the heavier trucks would uh, be parked on, looks like it goes into the property line. So well, is, there, is there an actual break there existing there now? You see what I mean? Well, uh, I, I, you see this. Yeah, that little, that little corner there would be what? They're south actually. East corner? Yeah, they're actually over a little bit into the. Uh, Land south of there, under the uh, power poles, I think it's their plan to go north again and, and resolve that issue as far as being outside their property. Um, so how does the, how does the city look at that though? I mean, are are you wanting an uninterrupted boundary, or are you well, going I, I to take account of what's there and assume that that's well? Uh, I think that that area there, they could uh, when they pulled their operation north again and kind of cleaned up that area, they could plant some trees along there to eventually grow up. And, but again, as you notice, there's nothing south of there the, other than that pump station. That's what's in the little, uh, okay. in the little house there. Okay, ma'am, did that answer your question, more or less, or do you seek further information? Well, basically, what there's, because, yes, I'm sorry. What, 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 they're, what they're trying to say is, because right now it's, it's residential agricultural zone, but it has to become commercial if there's to stay there. Yes. And commercial abutting up against a residential area, there's a requirement in the city for some kind of screening buffer, which includes trees and things like that. So it would not behoove them to remove things that are already there. If they do remove them, then there's, the city would say, you need to put something back. I see. And if things, if it, some has already been removed, is that a possibility in the plan? To well, put uh, a that buffers some. probably there's certain dimensions and things that Stuart could tell us about, but uh, I don't remember the width of the. Well, of the uh, most buffers are a combination, of, especially in a case like this, or would be a combination of fencing and landscaping. Here, a fence would have no value. Yeah. So uh, you would want to, uh, there's one area you can see that's sort of directly south of where those vehicles are parked. It, it appears to be thinned out somewhat. I think some of that would have to be replanted with some trees. I think this is one of those situations you'd have to go out there and actually look in the field to determine. This picture's close to two years old now, so it, it would kind of need to go out there and take a look and update the information. Thank you. So, yes, something should be there. Thank you. Sure. So you're saying that we should have in here then some stipulation as to what this barrier should look like? No, uh, this is strictly a rezoning. You can't make any conditions of approval on a rezoning. It would be just a vote yes or no in favor of the application. That would be have to be something that we would look at when uh, the application was submitted for a uh, permit for the parking lot paving and so forth. That's right. And I didn't say this before, but the public hearing portion of this case is closed. So the commissioners have any comments, questions of staff, questions of applicant? My question was about the buffer also, which I think you've answered, is that you deal with that in a different time. All we are doing is the rezoning, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Have you, so uh, has the applicant talked with you folks and said that these are indeed their plans going forward 
as far as what the improvements show? Well, we've met with Mr. Gamble and uh, the applicants, I don't know, three, four weeks ago and went over all this stuff in general. Um, and he, he created this uh, preliminary site plan, so to speak, from that. It uh, has to be fleshed out with uh, details added, uh, you know, pavement thicknesses and so forth. Um, so I guess that he, they're an understanding of what we're looking for, if that's what your question is. Yeah, my question is, was, and I know it, it can vary when it's all said and done, but what exactly are you requiring of them this, after the zoning changes? Well, um, from a site standpoint, it would be uh, a paving of a certain portion of the site. I think the stormwater would have to be looked at as far as uh, the detention basin that would be provided with any outlet. Uh, I think we'd want to look at the house, which was converted to an office, and see if it meets our standards for exiting and commercial use, that sort of thing. And the, they are providing three parking spaces for non-staff people, I guess you could say, and we want to see that. And uh, the pavement uh, design, the thickness and location, all that sort of thing. And part of that could be the landscaping uh, around the perimeter, especially, obviously, the southern, southern edge. In this case, I'd probably have to go out there and look and say, well, it's kind of thin here. You need to plant some more trees, something like that. Okay. Have they also obtained a business license? Well, they applied for a license. It was denied because they can't get a license until this property is properly zoned. I see. Okay. All right. So is there special compliance um, codes for fuel since they have fuel on the site? Uh, that would be up to the fire department. Okay. Um, there probably are, I just don't know what those are. Okay. And that would also be reviewed as part of the building permit process. Okay. That was the second part of my question. Okay. Are there any other questions or a motion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I move that Moes Construction's request to rezone the property at 19901 East US Highway 40 from RA Residential Agricultural to C3 Service Commercial be approved. Do I have second. a second? Okay. Billy moves and Tina second. Well, city staff, please call the roll. <coughs> Commissioner Boley? Yes. Commissioner Goldsberry? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner McLean? Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh. Yes. Case number 18-100-01 rezoning of 19901 East US 40 Highway has been recommended by us. Good luck, gentlemen. And thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to move next to case number 18-100-02 rezoning of 16800 East Sunset Drive. Will the staff please uh, give the report? Richard Cash requests to rezone a 0.46 acre property located at the northeast corner of South uh, M291 Highway and East uh, Sunset Drive from R6 Single Family Residential to C2 General Commercial. Uh, the applicant intends to regularly park a food truck on the site to sell food and beverages and to promote his um, uh, restaurant, Little Richard's Family Restaurant. And um, this is the, uh, this slide has uh, the general location. You can see where Sunset Drive comes into the 291. Uh, this is the zoning for the area. Um, there is a area of R6 that basically abuts all around on the east side. Uh, commercial zonings are present to the southwest along the 291 frontage. Uh, the uh, aerial here shows the residential neighborhood that lies to the west or the east along James Downey and Sunset Drive um, spur that goes into uh, 291 right there. Um, 
the, as you can see from in the oval there, uh, the, the property, uh, former site of a residence uh, a couple decades ago, uh, the property is unimproved. Uh, the property is uh, sufficient in size uh, to, to park a food truck and the, the necessary uh, car or uh, parking that would be required for vehicles for customers. Um, this is the um, site right here so you can see the location of where the, the house used to be and uh, the driveway uh, coming down, the existing driveway apron that comes off of Sunset Drive. Um, so this is up on the site itself, um, and this is looking back toward the southwest. The, this is up above sunset, so sunset sort of in a dip there, and that intersection is up there to our right. Here's looking from below, you can see where sunset comes into 291, looking back at the property. snowy day there and then um, to the east uh, the adjacent residential neighborhood stretching off to the east there and then this is looking uh, directly up sunset looking south down 291 back toward the uh, 23rd Street uh, intersection about four blocks away to the south um, there's some residences that lie across 291 um, right here um, directly across from the property and you can see this is there's a break here it's the first break in the jersey barrier um, north of 23rd street and then this is looking northward toward the interchange with um, truman road that's down in the valley there uh, staff cannot support approval of a request to rezone the property to C2, which is general commercial. However, staff can support approval of an amended request to rezone the property to C1, neighborhood commercial. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, I'm ready to take those. Will this require, in your recommendations to mm -hmm. change, will that require the applicant to submit a new application, or is that a matter that we can act on? Um, he doesn't need a new application. Uh, this is a lesser zone. Uh, C1 is a lesser zoning than C2. So as long as you um, uh, do a rezoning for you down zone rather than up zone, it could be lesser than what was advertised. And I'm sure you had a good reason, but just the reason that you would rather have it C1 than C2. Um, C1 is a little bit more restrictive, of course, because it is a neighborhood commercial. And as um, in the staff report, I have listed those uses accepted or not accepted out, but the ones basically the ones under C2 are generally allowed in C1 except for the ones I spelled out in that paragraph. So that that, that cannot that, that can that are not allowed in C one. If he's not going to have a cemetery, he'll probably have no objection. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any questions of staff before I call the applicant forward? Okay. Would the applicant please come forward? State your name and address for the record, and make sure you speak into the microphone. Uh, little Richard's uh, family oh. last restaurant. It's Richard. Can you Cash. pull a little closer yeah. to you, please? Yeah. Now, Richard Cash from uh, own Little Richard's Family Restaurant on 291, and we decided that we'd kind of see what we could do by putting a food vendor truck up there. I have. Uh, Mr. Cash, can you speak into the microphone a little bit oh. more? I uh, have a food vendor truck that I have a license from the city and just having a place there to uh, be able to put our rig to 
advertise our business that sets a ways back from the main roads of 291 highway and been there for uh, 25 26 years now here in independent serving to the people and we would like to be able to put a food vendor and and uh, a, like a produce place there for people to drive through and pick up stuff from you know the elder people that's around we uh, do a lot of things for the elders here in in independence with the restaurant so we'd like to be able to see if we could get it changed over and have a nice place for people and uh, the residents of the neighborhood too you know I mean it's all one thing together what uh, what do you think your hours of operation will be uh, we will probably be we'll probably be closed out by you know eight o'clock or so like we use the restaurant business hours from you know six to eight and it's just kind of like a drive-through for people to get biscuits and gravy or whatever sure. they want you know in the mornings and you'll move the truck back and forth from the restaurant to the site is that no the plan? we're gonna plan on leaving the rig set there until we have to do a catering you know to weddings or something like that then we pull the rig off the site and take it to weddings and because some of this is kind of to advertise that your restaurants down the ways a bit um, <clears throat> most of the signage you'll just I mean all the signage will be on the the uh, food truck itself yes it will there be, be any other other signs out in the yard or uh, it might be something that, you know we you got sweet corn or tomatoes you know I'm growing tomatoes we're gonna do community tomatoes if people has them you know they can bring them over and you know we can resell them to the public you know for other things okay and um, where exactly are you gonna park the truck the and, and then where will the other people you know people who pull up there where well the people pulls up there they it's kind of gonna be kind of like a drive-through situation but they can get out and there will be parking from the uh, north side of the piece of property you know that you'll be able to get into it's a pretty good size <clears> lot on the screen behind you they've put up a little uh, map for it can you kind of or up there <laughs> yeah it's got a pretty good size uh, square pad where the existing buildings that there it's all concrete that that's where we're going to park the rig at and then you have the things that's uh, headed north to the tree line that uh, there'll be areas for somebody wanting to get out and get it or they can just make a drive and do the drive through Okay, so when you say drive through, it indicates that there needs to be a drive. <laughs> so would there be like a loop or something? Because it looks like yeah, to me there's only one way in and one way out. From the north side of that lot right there, you can turn right around and come right back to the front side of it and then be headed back out to sunset whenever you make a loop around there to be able to come. And so you're going to put like a gravel drive in? Because it looks like it's grass to me. but it it's Yeah, it's gravel. It'd be gravel in there for now, you know. I see. Okay. I talked to the neighbor that uh, was uh, west of me, and the only thing that he said that he really enjoyed being there, but he said that if I would put a, you know, a shadow fence up along the side of the property line to be able to have his wife be able to have a swim pool, he said that he was, you know, really good with it and stuff. So, so on the screen that's on there now, is that item in the middle? Is that like a electrical? Yeah, that's electrical Outlet. hookup okay. for us to be able to run power over from the city to be able to power up the rigs and, you know, we have a reefer unit that we'll be setting up there, you know, for we can store the food and stuff in the reefer unit, you know, to keep it okay. up to par. Okay. Um, thank you for answering my questions. Are there any other questions? You, you, you referenced the food truck <coughs> as a rig. What's the size of that rig? Uh, it's a 30-foot rig that we have a smoker. We have just about every appliance on it that we have in our restaurant for if we go to catering, weddings, or any of that type of things, we can pretty much well it's deep a, fry. Is it a self-propelled unit or is it a trailer? It's a trailer. I don't mean to interrupt, but we also have that lit at night. Huh? Will, will it be lit up at night since you're planning on leaving it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll be putting some lighting up for, you know, just for insurance for somebody comes and tries vandalism or something like sure. that. Sure. Okay. 
Any other questions of Mr. Cash here? Uh, do you intend to operate a cemetery or any mausoleum or cremation services there? No. No. <laughs> You no, we're just going to operate any other type of business other than the sale of food and beverage. Food and beverage and produce. You know, produce. if you come and get a cold watermelon, no, no, no cemetery. No cemetery. No cemetery. No yeah. animal hospital. No animal hospital. Yeah, I don't like my food that well done. So. Enjoy that raw. Yeah. <laughs> so. The cars that park, choose to park, they'll be parking on the grass, is that? No, they'll be uh, parking on the gravel. It uh, maintains uh, just gravel through the whole complete <coughs> lot. Once we put our semi-trailers to the north side of the property, you know, we're going to be able to put our advertisement on that for our reefer unit to be able to keep our food in is basically what that part is. Without you, look, a question to the staff. What he's opening is substantially a miniature restaurant on wheels. Uh, how does the parking apply here? What type of surface is required? Is the existing surface sufficient for a 30-foot rig? There's a piece of concrete that's there. It's probably 60, 70 feet long. I mean, it. it it's a rather large area that's been graveled. So, um, I mean, as far as public, imp as far as improvements go, is, is that what you're asking? Yes. I mean, generally what tr triggers improvements would be when there's building permits. So, if I could. Uh, just to clarify, so the the existing surface I think right now on there is gravel. Um, now, as far as the business license goes with that, you know, Brian is right. Typically, we'll uh, review on any building permit that would be pulled uh, regarding the surface. Now, in the business license, zoning does have some review authority in that. Um, I know Public Works also has uh, some clout in this as well, too. So between those two departments, I think we'll kind of take a look at uh, you know the type of surface that is needed on this and make that determination through the business licensing process okay. Do you look satisfied Billy with that answer? <laughs> <laughs> or just I was thinking of my the paradigm that I was operating from I was thinking a food truck <clears throat> Mr. Cash kept saying a rig and therefore my I'm just Processing. Yeah, I mean, it, rig, trailer, whatever it may be, Does we're still going to. Yeah, we'll still look at it as a food truck. The the business like, sorry, the business licensing section that we have, and do you have that section on there? I know we had that at one point. I'd have to go back and look at that. There's some specific requirements as it relates to food trucks, as well, far as what they're required to do. Um, just off the top of my head, I know one of them. They're supposed to get permission more or less from the neighbors within so many feet and I, I, I can look and get that specific for you if you want but there's a there's a list of things that uh, Mr. Cash will have to do before he gets his business license and yeah I, I just don't want him to get blindsided everybody's expecting a mm -hmm. food truck 30 foot rig sits there de facto restaurant and all of a sudden we change the rules on him and yeah, the, the size and the type of food truck have no bearing on what that would be. I mean, that's going to be consistent throughout the process of, you know, it could be a, it could be a box truck that's a food truck and it could be a 30-foot rig and it's going to be the same requirements. Um, before you leave, Charlie, if you were going to leave, I'm not rushing you off, but Mr. Cash, did you also say besides the food truck you were planning on having a reefer for storage? Yeah, a truck for we can uh, keep food there on the site. It's now, a, is that like going to look like well, beyond wheels and a jack? And it's going to be yeah, a, it'd be a semi trailer. It's what they call a reefer unit. It's okay. a forty-two foot one and like a fifty-two foot trailer. Sure. Okay, thank you. I just want to be sure I heard that. So that's okay, right? Um, I, 
I, I can't confirm that at this point in time. We'd have to look at that a little bit further just to make sure that would work with the operation. Um, again, now we're looking at the zoning request tonight. Obviously, that's going to help. The zoning is kind of the first step on this thing to make sure that we can get to where we need to be. Now, from there, we'll look at the individual things that go along with that and make sure that that works as well. Well, whether or not this is the correct time to say something, let me give you an observation. <laughs> okay. He's got to agree to whatever you say if we change the zoning. If we change the zoning, then the zoning's changed. Maybe that's okay because you'd rather this be commercial anyway. So I'm not wanting to do something that's kind of up in the air. Yeah, and, and so and again, how do we resolve this? Well, that's and that's why staff was saying we'd rather have the C1 than the C2 because you know depending on what would happen with the site in the future, you know, if Mr. Cash is to pass the site on to somebody else and that person sells it and that person sells it, uh, we're assured with the C1 zoning that. Uh, we're not going to get a use out there that's going to be problematic with the neighborhood, mm -hmm. problematic with the traffic on Sunset on 291 and, and further on there. So, I, I mean, from staff standpoint, again, we if it's C1 zoning that's put in place on here, I think we're assured that whatever goes in there is going to be appropriate for that area. Because it makes more sense for it to be C1 than single the family C2, yeah. residential. And, and, you know, the C2 allows, or you guys kind of explained some of the stuff that the C2 allows, but, you know, even more, uh, C2 would allow a used car a lot, uh, could allow a gas station, stuff like that, where the C1 kind of locks that down and doesn't allow some of those uses. So, so once the zoning, if the zoning goes through today, then you're going to work out the details with him. Will he come back before us, or will you have to go to the council, or you just On work On the business it out? itself? No, that'd yeah. be part of the business licensing process. Okay. All right. Anybody else have questions of Mr. Charlie? If we're getting ready, uh, we're getting ready to uh, buy the other pieces of property. You know, further north, that's you know bad shape. You know, I take care of the corners. I mow the property at mow dots and the other pieces of property. Keep it view for the people. Well, just Mr. Yeah, just just like like Mr. Preston said. We're just trying to be careful because we don't want to get in a situation and then, you know, nobody has, we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I have no problem. Just may not be the appropriate time to say this, but I have no problem with you doing something on there. It would be nice to see that section of highway have something on there. So um, let me ask anybody, do any of the commissioners have any other questions of Mr. Cash? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm curious as to your current operation, Little Richard's Restaurant, that's going to remain in business and this is going to be a secondary business for you? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's, it's still be there. Okay. Yeah. We're hoping to plan on building a new building at Little Richard's location down there, just north of the building there. I've noticed you have improvements there. Yeah, I wondered what you were doing. Yeah, we filled a whole hole in there and uh, mm -hmm. that's where we're going to put a new building in there for... Uh, to make it a lot nicer, you know, and bigger for the people to come in. It's handicapped wheelchairs and access to the building. If everything goes good, we'll be in good shape. Wonderful. Any other questions from the commissioners, comments from um, Mr. Cash? I just have a, it's a question, comment, comment, question. But I am always happy when, when there's good progress and in independence and we can make something that's not useful, useful. My concern is when you said refrigerator truck, I know how loud they are. And so my other concern is always to protect the residential areas that exist. For quality of life, of course, is important, but I do know how noisy those trucks are. Well, we call it, uh, we call it a reefer unit because it has a backup generator uh, compressor on the front of the rig. Right. That's why they call it a reefer unit, but it is gonna have a, an electric coolant system inside of that rig so the only thing that if the reefer had to kick on that be the time of emergency without power going to the unit to keep the refrigerator up to par that's when uh, okay the reefer unit would kick on you know just for a backup that makes sense so it's electric most of the time and then if for something power goes out or whatever. Yeah, it would be just like one of the cooler units we have at the restaurant. It's on the roof that's gonna be underneath the rig. It won't be sitting on top of the rig. It'd be hanging on the bottom. So there won't be much noise coming okay. off of an electric fan motor. Okay. 
Well, would that prevent you from doing any other type of screening or any type of landscaping around the bottom of that? My, because my question, <laughs> my observation is it might look nicer if that looked more like a permanent building instead of like a back of a truck sitting there. Yeah, once we uh, uh, get the units up there, we would be boxing in the bottom side of it, you know, with awesome. metal to make it look nicer for you don't just see an open unit, you know, I mean. We'll make it look nice whenever we. Okay, that's much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Cash. Thank you. Is there anyone else uh, in the here that would like to speak in favor of this? All right. Is there anyone here that has questions or is opposed to this? Please state your name and address for the record and make sure you speak into the microphone. Katherine Spencer. I live with my mother, Mrs. Georgia Shipman, at 16808 Sunset Drive, Independence. That's the second house um, east of 291. Okay. And since I'm not the landowner, I would like to respectfully request to ask a question and, and make a comment for her. Yes, you may. Thank you. Uh, my question is, the entry road from Sunset Drive is very narrow and it runs along the fence of the house next to us and I was uh, wanting to make sure there was going to be a high privacy fence there to protect the privacy of our neighborhood uh, yards. There's no trees or anything, there's just the fence, the road, his business, and on the other side our residential property. Okay. We'll get an answer for you. Is there any? And else? my uh, my comment is um, just a concern of uh, since there's so little parking space, uh, especially since I didn't realize there were going to be um, the larger trucks there uh, about people parking on Sunset Drive every day during the work uh, day about two thirty. 291 South becomes a parking lot, yeah. and they use Sunset Drive to cross over to James Downey, and uh, that includes city buses and often semis. So if there's parking on either side of Sunset Drive, that's gonna narrow that center and be an issue for the residents. Okay. I have nothing against or in opposition of uh, the proposal at all except those two comments. Sure, I think those are valid concerns. We'll get an answer for you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, anybody else that has a question or comment or is against? Okay, public hearing of this is closed. Staff, could you give an answer to whether a screening will be required where it abuts residential? Well, again, um, screening is, I mean, a function of when we have a uh, building, it, per building passes, permit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, it's, a it's, building permit. It would then, be required if this passes. Know. But it's not required if it's a food truck, correct? Because it's not a building? Well, but it's. But the lot is great um, commercial. But he already said well, I would think that it would be because told the neighbor that he would put something there. <coughs> well, let's let's see what's on the books here. <laughs> okay. Real quick, I, and and maybe you want to invite the applicant back up. But I believe uh, in his testimony when we opened this case, he stated that he was going to put up a fence. Um, at least that's how I recall. But I would uh, probably ask you to bring him back up and clarify. So a fence that. would satisfy the city's requirements. I mean, if there was a fence put up, yeah, it would, it would probably meet any screening that we would have required, yes. And it would need to be six foot, eight foot? Um, again, it's one of those things where we don't have a building permit that's going to be put on here, so I'm not sure that we have any requirements for the screening uh, with a food truck. It's probably a hole that we have in our ordinance, but um, again, I, I, I guess I would ask you to bring the applicant back up and see if there is a proposal to do that. Uh, we can look at it through the... It, it, 
this is just, it, it's really, it's kind of a stranger process for us since it's a food truck, it's not a permanent building. Usually when we have permit buildings come in, we have a permit review process that they have to go through and they have to meet a lot of requirements. Now, since this is a mobile unit, it obviously will not be permitted uh, and that's kind of where some of the disconnect falls in place on us. It is allowed as long as the zoning's in place, but. Uh, well, wouldn't it be similar to having a trailer home? I mean, it's got wheels on it too, but it doesn't move anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, if there was a trailer on the site, there wouldn't be any necessarily requirement for screening. But you're selling, so it has, it's got a whole nother different. Issue. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, and as long as you're up here. <laughs> what about the street? Yeah. Narrow street, are there any signage? Is there any? Well, in. And I'll look to you guys a little bit. We do have a requirement for a sufficient off-street parking that will be required, I think, through the business licensing process. And I'm almost positive that was one of the requirements that I told you before. I think there's like three or four requirements in the business licensing section. And I think off-street parking being required is one of them. Um, you know, this site is, it's a, it's a pretty large site, depending on how much room the food trucks are going to take up. So uh, as long as, you know, there isn't a humongous line of cars on here, uh, I wouldn't think that would really be a problem ever. Well, but again, um, have really some businesses flourish food. more than others, and it could become an issue, yeah. So and it all has to be within that blue line on the diagram, right? Because the rest of it's state? Yes. Are there state markers out there right now? Uh, I'm not familiar with the site. As far, I mean, I, I've driven past it, but I haven't done a walkthrough. So, yeah, I'd, I'd well, ask it. You'd probably bring the applicant back up because yeah. those are a lot of questions. I think he can answer. Speaking to the microphone. Thanks. Hey, I bought the piece of property from Modot. Modot oh. had it for sale, so I bought it from Modot. You know, to be able to put the, it there. So. Okay, but it has the markers, and you know, kind of know where the property yeah, line is. Yeah, the property so. lines is the fence, and then it has. Uh, on the east side of the property, it has a, a garage there, and then it goes to the house, and then it has a rise bank, probably three to four feet up high, and then we was gonna put a six foot shadow fence all the way down across the property line because the back part of that piece of property east of there where that driveway comes there is a kind of like a utility road easement for all three pieces of property that lines up on the side of 291 Highway. Okay. So give me your best guess as to your trucks park there and you say people can drive through and like, they drive through and is there like, there's not really a drive through window. They drive through and then they get out and order at the window. Is that how they do no, it? No, they can drive around the front. We have an awning that comes out on the front oh, of the rig okay. that we set tables out. And if you drive up, you know, and if the handicapped people or the people that can't get out, can just say you know that they would like to have you know barbecue or they'd like to have some produce and we'll be able to provide it to them to their car so give me your best guess as how many cars that would actually visitors customers would actually be able to be on that lot uh really i don't know i mean it could be you know go slow i mean we could go fast hopefully we do good for you know but i don't so know what, what if if Probably something crazy happened, time, 20 people came there, 20 cars came there, it would hold 20 cars? You could park 20 cars in there. So chances are? If you wanted to park 20 cars in yeah. it, you could. Okay. Well, we're just, what we don't want to see is, of course, you know, they're trying to get in there and it stacks up and it starts to go out on the highway. No, uh, the entranceway on, on there is, is pretty wide. It's uh, MoDOT's requirement, you know, for coming off the 291 highway. It has a wide approach yeah. going up to the street uh, to where our driveway is down before it goes off the MoDOT okay. to the wide part. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brian, are there... Are there signs, street signs out there saying no parking or? No, there's nothing right now. I mean, that's not designated as a no parking area. So, Is that something that would be considered by the city? I mean, it sounds like it's a problem. I anyway. mean, theoretically, <laughs> the portions that are city right away and not state right away, um, that could be recommended. Yeah, the city uh, traffic engineer would go out, review the site, make a study, and then make a recommendation, or actually, I think she has the authority to 
install have have installed no parking signs. And that'd be kind of part of the business licensing procedure. Uh, that no, that would me? probably wait till the business was actually in force. Sure. Okay. Because there's nothing really to 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 compare with just a business license. Okay. All right. I'm still Did that answer your questions as much as it can be at this time? <laughs> <laughs> the gavel has come down, so I, I'm sympathetic. I, you know, sometimes you have to open a dialogue with people and make sure that you're always talking. Okay. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, folks. Any other comments, uh, motions? I'd like to make a motion that case number 18-100-02, the rezoning of 16800 East Sunset Drive, be amended from the C2 to the C1 from R6 to be approved. Second. And that's okay, Stuart? Or I, I think you could do that as one motion. Amend it and then make a, make a recommendation as part of that. Okay, I'm just asking. So just again, did we do that right? Does that satisfy the border well, standard? If you're, if you're, uh, if the motion was to amend the application to C1 and then approve the C1, then that's what the motion was, then we can that's proceed. So we're approving the C1, and then you want us to vote on it again? Well, you're voting one? on it as one motion. Okay. So it's been moved and second. Who was the second on that? Travis. Okay, so we're ready to vote. Uh, Commissioner Boley. Yes. Commissioner Goldsberry. Yes. Commissioner Preston. Yes. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner McLean. Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh. Yes. Case number 18-100-02, rezoning of 16800 East Sunset Drive has been approved. Good luck to you, Mr. Cash. Let's move on to the next. An oldie but a goodie, donation bins. Case number 17-17504, Unified Development Ordinance Amendment number 30, <laughs> donation bins. Have we talked about this yet? <laughs> not enough apparently <laughs> um yeah as you'll recall oh god i don't even remember when it was probably back in october now i didn't write the dates down on this and i apologize but back in about october i think uh the commission two separate times we went over this donation bid ordinance um made a few adjustments to it along the way ultimately the commission uh, passed it on with a, an unfavorable recommendation to the city council um, City Council did review it, um, had some of the same concerns that the Commission did, um, more specifically with who the responsibility laid on as, or as far as um, either the property owner or the donation bin owner. Um, there were some other concerns that Council brought up. Um, more or less, those were the number of donation bins we were allowing on each site, uh, as well as how they appeared along our commercial corridors. So. Um, we essentially went back to the drafting board, kind of really hashed this out with our code compliance division um, to see, you know, is there a way that we can get some responsibility onto the bin owners? Ultimately, um, I think we have kind of agreed that uh, we can put the, the responsibility on them. We can uh, pester these donation bin companies um, to, to try to get them into compliance. Uh, if it does come to a point where we would need to take some sort of judicial action on them, uh, it's still in question if we can go after those companies or not. It's it's just it's not really that simple to go after them. Um, however, uh, these haven't become a huge issue yet, uh, so we're kind of being somewhat optimistic and thinking that we can again work with the companies on these to get them out of there. If there is a situation where where we're not able to work with the companies, we'll move from there at the appropriate course of action. So you'll see in Section G that we've made that change there and, and put the responsibility on the bin owners. Um, two other things that we did change that the commission did not see on your last version. 
Um, we revisited the allowable number of bins on site. Currently we allow for sites of one acre or less to be limited to two bins and sites over one acre to be limited up to or be limited up to five bins. Um, council really didn't like that at all, so we went back. Uh, we changed it to sites of five acres or less are limited to just one bin and sites over five acres are allowed to up to two bins. So that really would decrease the number uh, of bins allowed on a site. Uh, furthermore, we did note that they should not be placed in right away. That's something that we uh, have already been enforcing, but we just further noted that uh, in this, this uh, ordinance change and also noted that they should be set back a minimum of 100 feet from any right away. So along any of the larger commercial corridors they would have to be set back at least 100 feet from any uh, of the corridors so with that um, I'm, I'm hoping we're getting to a point where everybody's starting to like this uh, together and if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them I do have one um, I know of one donation bin that comes to mind that is definitely closer to the road than 100 feet what enforcement action would it be taken once that because it's a, it's also a very unsightly one it's one of those ones that often overflows. It's actually right next to Little Richard's restaurant. There's a little mm -hmm. out of business orange ugly building that has a donation box there. Yeah, and that would also, and if it's a business that is not active too, that would also uh, break the first section in here that says you cannot be located unless the business has an active business license. So there'd be a few things on there. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to zoning, everything that's currently in place right now has to be locked into our current regulations. So on the current ones, we wouldn't have too much of enforcement uh, that we could put on them, but for anything that would come in in the future um, that we'd be able to say, hey, this wasn't here yesterday, it's now here today, so this is an issue, um, we would send the donation bin companies, try to get some contact information and work with them to get it out of there. Um, I, if, if the property owner happens to know who the donation bin company is and allowed it, I know in some situations that's not the case, but um, we'd work with the property owner as well and just see if we can get that moved back to meet our regulations. Okay. I know you probably don't want to hear this, but uh, <laughs> uh, when a business goes out of business, say they renewed their business license in January and they go out of business in June, do you guys pull their license? Is it no. defunct? Or it just continues on. Yeah, so somebody so in with theory the one, yeah. can go ahead and put a donation bin on there on a defunct business that still has a current business license. What do you do about that? Yeah, uh, I mean, within, so they have to renew their business license every year. So if they were to renew in January and go out of business in February, uh, you know, it'd be 11 months before we'd be able to really take action based off this ordinance because they would still have a valid business license. Um, the only way they would not have a valid business license is if we could get the business to withdraw or, or, you know, say they've closed, we can go in and close out the business license. But, you know, most of the time that doesn't happen. We'll be active until it comes to renewal time again, and then they will likely not renew. Okay, so, I mean, I know that's maybe a stretch, but if somebody were to complain during that period of time, you still could, you would have to tell them, I can't do anything until the business license expires. Yeah, based off the way that this is written, that, that would be the case, yeah. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question. The city does have a way of contacting the people that own the bins, correct? I mean, the only thing, we, we don't have contact information for them. I mean, we would just Google search or, you know, find a number on the bin and try to contact them uh, directly. But, yeah, we don't, uh, you know, none of these donation bins are required to have business license because most of them are for not-for-profit organizations. So we don't have direct contact for a lot of them. Um, but, you know, we could, uh, our enforcement staff can, can work some stuff and, and get, those, get that information. Because you're still saying these guys can go ahead and drop it there. They don't necessarily have to ask the business owner. Well, presumably that's still the case. And I think we did touch on that as, I mean, there's still, there, there's probably laws out there that protect the property owner and saying, you know, you need to ask my permission before you put something on my property that this ordinance doesn't need to cover. Um, but we would, we're presuming along this that, that most of them are willing to do that. And again, I know that's not happening, but. I know it seems like I'm trying to get you to rewrite this, but I'm just I'm just <laughs> putting these things out here, okay? Yeah. So just putting them out there. Um, and just one little housekeeping thing. I get, well, not really housekeeping. How do you guys handle this? Do you do you dispatch a city crew to do this, or do you have a 
company that bids to do these things by piecework or how you're talking you, the ones that would yeah if you had a ban them. or something yeah we we likely it? have to we when it comes to properties that that have junk on them we have uh, contractors uh, uh, I don't know how many contractors we have on this list it's a few that are on there and the city kind of rotates through them and picks them and they rebid on them I I don't know how often we rebid those people but um, so you ask them for bids yeah per piece at one point we do and then you know throughout the year we can pick them uh, again we rotate through that list so okay I don't have any comment right now does anybody else have a question or comment for Charlie I'm pretty excited. <laughs> but are you I mean, satisfied? I, well, <laughs> never. But I mean, I appreciate this. Is you know, thanks for working so work. hard on it. Yeah, it has yeah. This been one's been way. a lot of work. I, we didn't I think it would be so much, but it's I'm the excited little things to that matter. push it through. Little things that matter. But of course, I was really happy with it until Eric opened his mouth. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you could stick operating business in there or if that would help. Anybody? Uh, again, and you know, this is this is what we have proposed at this point. Um, similar to what we did with the last rezoning, the commission can amend language in here if you so see as part of your motion. So that that would be appropriate if that's something you want to add. Hey, we can do something. Good. There you go. <laughs> Why did you put only a valid city license, business license, as opposed to an operating business? Um, mainly because there are some businesses out there that don't have a valid business license, so that's our way of really pushing business license onto businesses so well, how about huh. the word and yeah we could again that, that could definitely be added can, can you do that yeah you know the hope is at some point that we have uh, all our business license <laughs> or all our businesses licensed um, yeah and explain to me again the next sentence where it says uh, regardless of property zoning or business license status However, yeah. such bins, that, that's when it comes for, you're looking mainly at churches, schools, or other community service businesses right there. Because if you look in that first paragraph, or excuse me, that first sentence, it says they have to be kept on commercial or industrially zoned property. However, there's a lot of churches and schools that are residentially zoned, but we didn't want to disallow them to be on there. So that's where we talk about, you know, A, churches don't have a business license, schools don't have a business license, and a lot of them are on residential property. So we don't want to disallow a donation bid to be placed on those types of uses. All right. Did you want to add something? Um, you want to read that sentence? Like, you're working on a sentence. Addendum to at the end of the very first paragraph, the let red lettering, business license and an operating business. Can we do that? Can you insert that? You can. Read, say that again. <laughs> can you read it again, please, Bill? Uh, dot, 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 with a valid city business business license and, and an operating business. I, maybe can I offer a suggestion in that and okay. where it says, end on a property uh, of a operating business with a valid city business license. So. That's simpler. It's Good point. Just putting the word operating in front of that business. And I think that would cover both of them. You're on a roll. And operating business. more efficient all about efficiency so I'm sorry to go back to get it so why do you have to even mention you you said that institutional schools don't have to have a business license mm -hmm. well what's the exception there 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 might be some well, I mean what you you want know saying you like put it in there but is there an exception yeah I mean, there what? might be some <laughs> I mean, religious assembly doesn't need a business license. I'm thinking there could be some institutional or community service that would be for profit that would require a business license. I mean, the the thing the thing that triggers not requiring the business license is a not for profit status. So, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, 
that that would require it, but at the same time, I don't think adding that language in there really does much harm to the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just, it just kind of covers I'm just trying the cases where there may be something like, that does require. Well, one. if they have it, the wording, almost sounds like if they have a business lighting license, then you have to look at the status of the business license. So, but most of these you're saying don't have a business license, so. Yeah, most of the uses that would fall in those category wouldn't have a business license because they'd be not for profit. But uh, you know, there could be something that could be for profit that would require a business license that okay. just kind of covers. Okay. Operating adds value; it doesn't diminish anything. Excuse me. That one word adds good value, but doesn't diminish anything. Mm -mm, I don't think so. My quick rundown of it, I, I can't see where that would hindered at all all right but again if that's going to be part of the motion just just make sure that that's built into your motion well having said the magic word motion do I have a motion just note that there's nobody here in the public and you're not opening the public hearing to no. open close up. is anyone here in favor of this would like to speak is there anyone here opposed Mr. Chair. Public hearing is closed, so Billy, go ahead. The case number 17-175-04, Unified Development Ordinance, Amendment Number 30. Uh, I move that that be adopted with the change in adding the word operating in se se section 14-400-09A, that that should read donation bins may be kept on property zone commercial or industrial when on a parking lot adjacent to the building slash tenant space and on a property of an operating business with a valid city business license. I move that that be approved with the amendment, uh, with the change. I second okay. it. Tina seconds. Billy moved, Tina seconds. Ready? Ready. I've been ready. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Boley? Yes. Commissioner Goldsberry? No. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner McLean? Yes. Chairman Eschbach? Yes. Case number 17-17504, Unified Development Ordinance Amendment number 30, donation of bins has been approved as amended by Mr. Preston. <clears throat> okay, we move on to case number 18-175-01, Unified Development Ordinance number, Amendment 32, Special Events. Hi, my name is Christina Heinen. I'm Special Projects Manager with the City of Independence. Hey, Christina, could you speak in the microphone a little bit more? Yes, yes I can, thank you. My name is Christina Heinen. Again, I'm a Special Projects Manager with the City of Independence. Uh, I'm putting forward this UDO change. Uh, we are working on a special policy, a new special event policy application and event rules guide, which would take the place of the current portion in the UDO. Um, this would become a comprehensive application where if someone was holding a special event, it would, um, they would fill out this one application, it would get routed to all the different departments and then come back. Um, I'm open to any questions. I don't know how much information you guys want or need. Uh, as I understand it, it was, it's, on, it's on file with the city clerk. It would be on file with the city it clerk. It would be on file. Similar um, to how the schedule of fees is handled right now. So it would be on file. It would be referenced in code, but it would be changed um, by a vote of the council. Anytime we would want something to be changed. This has actually, it's been presented in a study session. Um, but it hasn't had a first reading or anything like that. Is it your plan to have this available online for folks to look at it or how, what you tell me how you're planning on rolling this out? Well, initially it is going to be online as a fillable PDF. Um, we'll also have paper copies if someone would like to go old school and fill that out. Um, we hope eventually for it to be um, made so that online it's not just a fillable form, it's something that helps them if they click a button it takes them to that next section so it'll be a lot easier and faster to fill out 
um, that takes time to program. So we're working with our tech services department to make it as easy and as simple as possible. What's the current process? The current process is if you're going to have a special event, you're sent to multiple departments. Um, if you're going to have a parade, you need to go to police first, and then you need to head over once you go to police to public works. Um, you know, if you're going to have a big event where you're going to have food and close down streets, you need to also go to the health department. You need to get those. The idea is that you fill out one application, and instead of being sent to multiple departments, those departments then provide feedback, you know, back to the event coordinator, so that they're not running around trying to guess where they need to go. Um, the city will tell them what's needed, review it, work with them on their plan. Um, if there's any questions or anything that needs help with, you know, we would help. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Sounds like in a matter of just tremendous improvement in mm -hmm. efficiency. That's the hope. Um, similar jurisdictions uh, of our size, you know, Kansas City has, has one special event permit that people fill out. Springfield does it. There are several others in our area that do something similar. You know, we hope to do it. We've staff have actually been working on this for over a year now, trying to get it moved forward. Um, we hope that we're close to the finish line now. And the the date that you that's on here is May first of this year. That's when you hope to have it available, right? That's when we would hope it would go into effect, uh, with the idea that there would be a sixty day period for education of not only staff but event coordinators, making sure that we're reaching out to anyone and everyone that's had an event recently, that they know that there's this change in policy. Um, anyone who had already applied for an event, you know, somebody who already has a five k planned for June we're going to grandfather in them in. we're going to work with them we're not going to penalize someone for you know an ordinance change that wasn't in effect yet okay questions further comments of the commissioners pretty excited about this too wow here's, here's a your good can't night. your enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you very much no problem So we got the motion. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Are you still under the public hearing aspect of this? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's do a little housekeeping here. A little housekeeping. Is there anyone here that is in favor of this amendment? Is there anyone opposed to ask questions? Seeing no movement towards the podium, I declare the public hearing closed. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Mr. You Chair. Always? Yes. I move to approve case number 18-175-01, Unified Development Ordinance Amendment number 32 for special events. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Cindy moves and Billy seconds. We're ready for the vote. Commissioner Bully? Yes. Commissioner Goldberg? Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner McLean? Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh? Yes. Case number 18-17501, Unified Development Ordinance Amendment 32, Special Events, has been approved by us. Thank you for helping our city out. We appreciate it. say something I'm sorry yep, I'm, I'm just waiting for you to move on let's move on now move on. to other business the Fairmont district plan yeah real quick I just want to kind of give the Commission a rundown on this um, uh, this has been a work uh, in progress now for probably about two years I would say uh, going on on this um, we've been working with the consultants pretty um, tirelessly on this one to, to get this plan put together um, and, and what you're seeing is the result of that hard work through a huge steering committee uh, and all that. So um, I'm going to invite Jim Schusler from CFS Engineers up here. Um, they are the consultant who uh, has been really in charge of this plan, working through it, and the one that wrote it. Um, he's going to give a short presentation and answer any questions. Um, and then from there, I'll come back up and kind of explain next steps. Uh, does he need to be sworn in? Because I don't think that he was. Nope. Okay. He's fine. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Good evening, my name's Jim Schusler. I'm with CFS Engineers. I'm a landscape architect, and I'm pleased to be able to um, describe this plan to you. I've been working with Charlie and your city staff and the, the, the committee's stakeholders for about a year now. So we're on the final steps, steps for this plan. Um, so we'll quickly go through it. As Charlie mentioned, um, this plan has really came from community interests groups really trying to uh, rally behind. There was a PSP grant through the MARC that was ultimately the major funding piece of this um, project, all kind of focused on that community um, and um, interest in promoting it and, and revitalizing their community. The plan uh, was uh, uh, um, completed by the City of Independence, MARC, uh, MODA and, and Shiro Creek also participated. My design team included Bike Walk KC, uh, Sheila Shockey, um, M MCD, uh, uh, Urban, um, well, they're the lawyer type uh, person as well as a developer, uh, URI. Uh, the project area is kind of shown within this area. It's pretty much Sterling Road on the east to the, the railroad bridge on the west. So about uh, six tenths of a mile um, in that area and then uh, to the north and south um, uh, incorporating some of the neighborhoods within that area. Uh, we went through a traditional planning process where we did site analysis, inventory, uh, we looked at different scenarios and options that we'll talk about today and then ultimately create recommendations for land use, roads, uh, amenities, um, et cetera, as well as an implementation plan that we'll discuss today. Uh, our, our plan did have a very intensive and extensive uh, community engagement process. We had two public meetings. We had stakeholder meetings about every two months. We had two focus group meetings. We have presented to city council once. Um, and so this is kind of um, the results of some of those that we have shown behind me. Uh, some of the couple of public meetings, we asked the public to uh, participate in helping us identify goals for the roadway as well as the pedestrian spaces, uh, uh, come up with recommendations for de development scenarios. Uh, the chosen one you'll hear more about is more of a neighborhood uh, type district environment and then major decisions such as traffic calming and other promenade designs, stuff like that. So the plan that you've all hopefully received uh, looks like that. Uh, within that plan is a variety of different design components uh, that we'll kind of go through in general. Uh, I'll say this a couple times, but we are, we are maintaining the five lanes of traffic through there. We're not making major changes to the road environment. Um, we did have two meetings with MoDOT as well on this. I'll probably say that again <laughs> when we come to that. But ultimately, it looked at uh, promenades, road configuration, access management, amenities within the area, uh, and really the engagement or creation of the community spaces. As part of the process, we also looked at the flooding issues. That's a, uh, um, a major issue, as you know about, but ultimately the plan just says there's a flooding issue, and ultimately, um, as you might know, there's two legal actions pending right now with the uh, hearing in March. Um, the plan uh, looked at its place in the community, looked at the regional connections. I met with uh, the Parks and Rec director to understand how this plan could incorporate some of the regional connections he is working on in his staff. There are, is the Fairmont Trail or the trail that is connecting this area to Fairmont Park uh, through uh, 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 widened sidewalks and the existing trail systems within that area. And ultimately, how can we connect to the south to Hill Street, Hill Park, and then eastwardly along Truman Road and maybe to Truman Library? We looked at three different concepts um, for how to develop this area, and so I'll go through those quickly. The first one is kind of closer to Armor Road in North Kansas City, really creating on angled on-street parking to really promote the businesses, provide that 
uh, needed on street in improvements to really make this more of a business district. There was some increased um, green space shown at kind of the bump out islands and stuff like that. The second concept we looked at was a road diet where we actually removed a lane of traffic. We went to a three lane configuration that provided the most pedestrian spaces, the widest promenades, and as many the larger amenities, landscape zones, and stuff like that. But is, um, and the third concept we looked at was uh, the chosen concept, which is really to maintain five lanes again and create those public spaces, the bike facilities on either side um, through the heart of the Fairmont District. Um, and I'll describe that in more detail in a second. We did a kind of scoring system of those three different concepts, and again, the third concept was rated the highest, was except was it thought to achieve uh, most of the goals. Uh, MoDOT support, which is probably the most important, um, as it is a U.S. highway or MoDOT um, jurisdiction, uh, but also uh, potential to leverage dollars, public dollars, to make the enhancements more uh, financially feasible. The, uh, so we'll kind of go into the, the master plan and the different components. Um, as you see here, again, it's from Sterling to the railroad tracks. Um, for the most part, the three blocks from northern to the west, the railroad tracks are really where the, the promenade would be, where the intensive development uh, pedestrian spaces would be from northern to the east, which has uh, Sugar Creek, uh, having ownership of the northern side that would be more bicycle facilities bicycle promenade connecting to uh sterling the mayor uh, and city manager shirt creek were very much um in favor of this the mayor attended both of both of our public meetings as well providing input so going into some more of the details the promenade in that that more um uh, centralized fairmont district that three blocks includes a lot of um, in, um, enhancements to the pedestrian space. Uh, it has um, the, the island, the landscape island that does, um, with orienting of the streets from north to south right now, there none of the streets are really oriented across 24 from each other. So realigning roads specifically is shown here at uh, uh, Ash Street, which is Hutting, you have that double light fixture, the double traffic lights, so those were being combined into one of those. This plan, if I step backwards, was a lot of these ideas did come from the 2006 Highway 24 corridor plan, and so some of these ideas were taking forward and saying these are still valid, which is, that was one of those ideas. Uh, as shown in purple is more of the pedestrian environments, the larger plazas for outdoor cafes, stuff like that. Uh, we have bike facilities on either side of the road, parallel parking, um, and even some of the public space that's coming in within that. We talk about bike facilities, we're, we're recommending protected bike intersections, similar to this diagram shown behind me. We're ultimately, uh, you're creating a, a, a bicycle route within the intersection um, that is protected behind curbs um, to ultimately encourage the best pedestrian and bicycle facilities. There are transit stops shown on either side of here of, of Ash Street. Uh, there is a master plan also going on how to bring the BRT um, uh, to Independence and, and 24 is one of the two corridors. And so we, with this plan, which be encouraged that to move to 24 highway and we're showing where the the best place for transit stops would be land use different than the 2006 master plan that i alluded to uh, we're not taking over any houses there is some uh, changes to industrial areas some uh, uh, commercial areas for parking behind and stuff like that but no houses are being affected and i think that's a substantial change from the previous master plan that is a success of this one uh, probably the highest rated, the most priority for this area is a public park. Um, they're looking for that infrastructure to be um, placed in there. The master plan talks about three possible sites for that along the corridor. Um, 
uh, and which allows uh, the, the, the community to negotiate with different sites to see what those are. Some allow a full-size soccer football field on them to more of just a recreational area as shown in C. So those are kind of the three different sites that the master plan talked about. The uh, master plan also talked about a roundabout on the far west side. This is what MoDOT thinks is the best traffic calming device within this corridor that they would support as the traffic calming device for this environment. Um, and, and so that is recommended within this plan as well. Uh, as well as street trees, lighting, and other amenities are all discussed within the plan. So the last two slides I have for you is the cost estimate. The cost estimate for this um, six-tenths of a mile is um, three-quarters of a mile, three th 30, around 32,000 uh, uh, linear feet is $8.1 um, million. That includes a one over a million dollar roundabout that includes a one million dollar public park and so you can kind of see that some of the big ticket items are kind of listed above and so if you choose as a city community to to do certain things over there the price tag can uh, move with that we also did analysis to how we would connect this to the truman library because there's a lot of federal dollars available one of those is called flap that's access to federal lands that would allow us to go after federal dollars to connect this area to um, the Truman Library, and so thus that would add another three million dollars to that. But ultimately, access allows the city to get access to, if won that grant um, uh, a substantial amount of money. And then, lastly, uh, I'll hint at this quickly. Charlie will probably respond. Um, our next steps are really adoption of this plan by City Council. Um, in February, we have a presentation set up for that, and then ultimately uh, we'll be presenting this plan to the Downtown Redevelopment Coordinating Committee in February, and then ultimately looking for uh, ways to move the plan forward with the creation of a deal, uh, plan of finance and other um, uh, items identified here on this list. And so I hope I didn't go too quickly, but I was trying to be conscious of your time and, and I'm available to answer any questions of myself or Charlie, who was the co-chair for the city on this project. One of the sad spots to me, and, and I just absolutely love the plan. Miss, Mr. President, could you speak in the microphone, please? I'm just totally excited about the plan. But one of the sad parts for me, uh, a dear friend and former mayor, Mayor Ryan, was shared with me Crisp Lake and that we were not able to do anything to return that wonderful place back to some of its former glory. So, so comment on that for me. I would love to the opportunity to comment on. We w through the stormwater analysis and stuff like that, we have uh, and documented our uh, our thoughts on that. The city does not own that lake, right. a, a subdivision that hasn't existed since like 1928 has jurisdiction over that. The plan, however, does recommend that, um, that the right of way abandoned from the railroad becomes the link to connecting the corridor to the northeast all the way through Truman. So getting access to the old railroad, which is the dam, and connecting us through the old railroad to the close to the intersection of Sterling and Truman is very much a part of this. So that getting public access to and the dam, redoing the dam, uh, one of the action items is um, is to uh, uh, well not listed on the screen, but ultimately is to put, uh, do environmental analysis of of the lake. We did discuss that with the city council. Um, as one of the uh, projects and uh, as well as um, uh, possible funding shares or leveraging to share costs on that through um, uh, different grants and other uh, options. And so um, though you are correct, uh, our recommendations are limited. They do include doing environmental analysis of that and trying to get access to the railroad right-of-way, which is on the levee, to connect uh, 
a, a trail environment, not just a, in addition to the on-street improvements that we have. In your imp <clears throat> implementation priorities, you talk about that that's the most important the piece. The community park environment, To solve yes. the flooding, right? So you yeah, you're right. It, that is definitely one of the top ones as well. So are we saying that without solving that, that the rest of it should not go forward? Or I mean, I know that's probably not one person's decision, but what's the general? Well, thing? I have personally had many conversations and our design engineers have reviewed and done extensive analysis on this. Uh, by speaking with city leadership from Independence as well as Sugar Creek, as well as property owners, um, and talking to MoDOT, we're all waiting to see what comes out of the two litigations. City of Sugar Creek, I understand, is suing the property owner as well as there is a, a civil suit from um, a property on 24 also. So there are two outstanding legal uh, battles and we're going to, we're, yes. The lady owned the liquor store. Yes. Um, and, and so uh, we're waiting for that process. Everybody is kind of waiting for that process. But again, our mayor, our city manager was in direct contact with the city of Shore Creek and encouraged their lawyers to make th that. And honestly, there is a failure that is occurring along 24. MoDOT will have to come into play as the road is starting to sink um, in that location. It's a mess. So yes, um, it is definitely sure. one of the <coughs> highest priorities. Can the project move on without that? No, that is not correct. We plan on moving forward with many of the promenade and through uh, the city systems as well as through future additional uh, MARC um, funding sources through grants and stuff like that. I'd mentioned the FLAP, which is a federal land access um, plan. So we, we aren't waiting for that. So you had mentioned trying to connect it to Truman Library. Does connection mean that you have similar promenade architecture roads that go down to that, or exactly what does that mean? Uh, it is a reduced um, amenities. It does provide a 10-foot multi-use path connecting Sterling to the library to, to be able to get access to uh, multimodal funds, um, lighting, but not necessarily all of the uh, um, landscaping and, and uh, signage and stuff like that, special plaza zones and stuff like that. It is a, a, a smaller, um, a reduced uh, amenity cost to get access to that and really is when we su submit for this grant, when it, when it opens, you know, we will tr determine what that is, but it is important to understand the scope of work so that we can be able to get ready to write that grant. Sure. And just a just a comment. Um, I like I like everything <laughs> that you're showing. I think it is critical that which is the third thing on here is that there needs to be a park. And I think that the the one I think it was B where the park is actually visible from the road. I think that's a I think it, the visibility of the park is a is is a big plus that would help that that community. So <clears throat> that's just for what it's worth. Um, and the other, the other thing is, and I, again, this is just a comment. Um, if this is done, I would hope that these would be mom and pop community based businesses and not national chains that come in there because I think this area needs to have that type of feel. Kansas City proper and other places have had these type of neighborhoods and they've done quite well and they're interesting to go to. I mean, you can see a McDonald's anywhere. So um, I don't know if you all have any kind of strategy to try to leverage that some way, but if you do, fine. If not, I know that might be down the road a piece. So. 
we, we've talked to developers. There was a developer on our team. Uh, the public was very, uh, and the plan describes how community-based um, businesses are the most interests, whether it's hair salon, uh, service-oriented environments. Um, so one, this, the community would like to share your same vision. Developers um, can see the interest of that. It, there is a, um, we've asked the Economic Development um, Council, or committee, council to help us to see what the opportunities are for land um, um, uh, accumulation uh, to uh, consolidation of land. Um, there's in some cases only a few uh, landowners in that area and we've heard that there might be some interest in selling. And so uh, to really make that development grow, we need to one, get rid of some of the blight that's in there. The city's been very uh, um, proactive on some of that. There's still some more work to be done, but then they kind of clean it up, maybe do some land uh, uh, consolidation and then bring in those developers, those interests that would be more community-based. I think this is a really exciting time to be part of the city. It really is. I love the plan, and I'm really excited for it. So how long will it take? Um, so if you, when you get to start. Two or three years, right? Right. We're, 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 it's important for our city to find partners, whether it's public-private partnership, leverage dollars through state, federal dollars. MoDOT's a player with this. Uh, um, Honestly, there's a lot of interest in creating a CID within this area as well, and that ultimately creates another funding source, or at least a maintenance source and stuff like that. So um, we're going to spend a, a, a you know at least the better part of nine months figuring out what the plan of finance is before you know that's kind of our first implementation on that is kind of uh, promote this within all of the city's interests and needs through the downtown redevelopment revitalization coordinating committee uh, and then after that um, uh, hopefully we will have a plan of direction two or three years once a go has been made you know nine months for design a year to construct regarding the grant for the trail to possibly connect over to the Truman Library I'm working on a project and have been for well over a decade that will ultimately, hopefully, put a 47-mile-long hiking, biking trail from Sugar Creek to Gardner, Kansas, in the old historic trail corridor of the Oregon-California Santa Fe Trail. One of those pieces we are using already is the Mill Creek to McCoy Park stretch. Is that where you're planning on coming in? Are you aware of this other plan and how we might interconnect these? We have been meeting with a lot of different groups. I. I this plan doesn't get us to this we're trying to get to hill park into the tr future truman uh road routes that um parks and rec is is doing um or interest in they have a grant that they're hoping to receive to connect um pretty much from the truman library to the southwest as well through the downtown and, and head that direction uh, we've also met with the rock island team and uh, I'm trying to help coordinate a meeting between the Rock Island team and the city independence to actually start to look at that. I think it's called the Mill Creek yes. Trail and kind of bring that into play. And so um, uh, I think there's a lot of excitement around trails and connectivity. And, and, and so um, uh, it's definitely a popular topic as well as there are federal dollars available for alternative transportation through that. So. About a year and a half ago, my organization, along with the National Park Service, um, got some money to mark, about $60,000, to hire a landscape architect firm, it was Virio, mm -hmm. who, who has now pretty much finished that study that I was referencing, and I believe they're unveiling it at Mark on March 7th, or thereabouts, if you're interested. I am very much interested, yes. I'll be there. Great. Okay, commissioners, any comments, questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate it.
Yeah, I want to thank Jim and his uh, organization as well too. I think they did a great job on this plan, and we've been we've been working with them for a while on this, and uh, hopefully you can see the fruits of the labor that have gone into this one. So, with that, um, what we would uh, request from the commission is a recommendation to forward on to council on adoption of this plan. Okay. Um, <coughs> do I have a motion to recommend this? I make a motion that the Fairmount District plan be forwarded on to the City Council for approval. I second. Okay. I second. Sorry. You ready? Um, yes, sir. Commissioner Boley? Yes. Commissioner Goldsberry? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner McLean? Yes. Chairman Ashbaugh. Yes. Okay, the Fairmount District Plan is recommended to City Council for approval. And now we're going on to uh, approval of minutes. And uh, I did notice something. Uh, I wondered how Cindy McLean seconded a motion when she was not here. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> In the first paragraph. Yeah, I, I noticed the first paragraph actually today when I was getting ready for this meeting on the, are you talking the August reference? Yeah, the very first paragraph mm -hmm. before other business. Now, if you'd buried it back in there, I might have missed it, but uh, <laughs> it's right there at the right. beginning. So. I'll fix. Was it Tina or did you, how, if I, not, I, how did you mistake one of these I, gentlemen? I have absolutely <laughs> no idea. <laughs> That's what I that. Well, and the date, the date of the meeting was wrong too. If you see on the first line there, August it was like August of 20. Yes. Cut and paste. Yeah. I, I, I and, and I'll admit I did that. There was something I cut and pasted on here and somehow I didn't make the right changes on it. So, um, well, I'll go back and make sure that we have the, We've got notes on that, and if I have to go back to the video, I'll correct that. Okay. Okay, so we'll approve it with changes, or? Or we'll defer. Or we'll see it next time. This is kind of unusual, I don't know. Yeah, why don't we just bring it back next time? Okay, we'll bring Does it back. Does anybody next remember time. who seconded the motion? I well, I have notes that we'll, we'll, we'll look at. You or yeah. You. yeah, we've got, like I said, we have notes on it. Yeah. I just, I, yeah, I had notes on the, on the meeting, on. so. We'll bring it back next time. Okay. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there any uh, thing that the commissioner would like to bring up or uh, the city staff has for us? Really? Okay. We will stand adjourned at 8.04 p.m. Oh, so three, three times, but we got it done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm That's really surprised. Well, and it was the right thing to do. I entirely missed the Kansas basketball.